Hello everyone, my name is Reza and I'm a research scientist at MIT. Today I'm going to talk about our research on scalable and ultra-low power Internet of Things for the Ocean. This is a joint work with my colleagues Sad, Ozvi, and Fado. There is an enormous interest in ocean IoT because of its huge potentials. As of 2018, more than 80% of the ocean remain unobserved and unexplored. With Ocean IoT, we can deploy a large number of sensors and have them transmit the information back to us. They can send us back the image or sounds of the animal to help us to explore the ocean, or of coral reef to expand our understanding of underwater climate change. Ocean IoT can also support aquaculture or fish farming, which is named as the fastest growing food sector by United Nations. Now, Ocean IoT can enable all of these applications. Unfortunately, existing underwater communication technologies cannot allow us to deliver on these applications. These technologies fall in two categories. In conventional form of underwater communication, if the sensor wants to communicate with the remote receiver, it's equipped with the speaker and on the receiver side we have a hydrophone. For those of you who are not familiar, we cannot use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to communicate underwater. So the sensor, the way that communicates is it generates acoustic signal and communicates information. The nice thing about this approach is we can get sufficient throughput. We can also communicate over a long range, which can be in the order of 50 to even 100 meters or even more. The problem, however, is generating acoustic signals consumes a lot of power. So if the sensor has a battery, it will drain the battery very fast. And what you need to do is to go out and replace the battery. And this is very costly. In fact, a research vessel costs around 50,000 a day to operate. And because of this, this approach becomes very costly to scale. To address these issues, our group last year came up with a new form of underwater communication, which is called backscatter. In backscatter, both transmitter and receiver are shifted to a one privileged location, which can be near the shore, and the sensor to communicate is equipped with something like acoustic reflector, and the way it communicates is just by modulating the reflected signal. In a simplest form, by choosing between reflecting and not reflecting, it can transfer the bits of zeros and one to communicate, so we can transfer any information. So, because in this approach we don't need to generate acoustic signal, this approach is ultra low power. And in fact, we can design a sensor completely battery-less and it becomes very cost-efficient to scale. But what we observed last year is this approach can give us a very limited throughput of about 2 to 3 kilobits per second, which limits us a lot to enable many applications. We were also only able to communicate over a very limited range of about 5 to 10 meters. In this talk, I will tell you about our system that can give us the best of both worlds to enable us to communicate with sufficient throughput over a longer range while having the low power and low cost of backscatter. I will be telling you about our technology which is called Ultra Wideman Underwater Backscatter or in a short form U-square-B. U-square-B is the first technology that enables scalable ultra low power and low cost ocean IoT. We are also introducing a novel metamaterial design for underwater backscatter that enables us to achieve higher throughput and communicate over a longer range while maintaining low power and low cost of backscatter. This is also the first demonstration of underwater backscatter in the wild. We performed our experiment in the river across different weather conditions such as snow and rain. Before telling you more about this technology, let me first quickly explain to you why our prior design was limited in throughput. The main problem that we had to face was underwater backscatter exploit resonant material that limits their throughput. Remember that for underwater backscatter communication, we use acoustic reflector to modulate the reflector signal and communicate. At the heart of our reflector, we use what is called piezoelectric material. And the way that we modulate the reflection is by tuning the vibration of the piezo. Now the problem is, while modulating the reflection and communicate relies on tuning the vibration of the piezo, the piezo itself can only vibrate around its resonance frequency. So, for those of you who are not familiar with what is resonance, let me explain to you by an example. Think of it as a guitar. I don't have a guitar here, but I have another instrument. If I plug any of these wires here, you will hear a different sound. And the reason is, 
By plugging these wires, this wire starts to vibrate at their resonance frequency. Similar to this string, when I hit the piezo with acoustic wave, it starts to vibrate and it tends to vibrate around its resonance. And the problem with resonance is it is very narrow band. So if I take a piezo with a resonance frequency at 20 kHz, for instance, and if I plot the amplitude of the vibration of this piezo, what you will get is looks like this, which is very narrow in band. And as a result, the communication with this element, because of its resonance, it has a very narrow bandwidth, and what we get is very limited throughput. The Strama solution to this problem is to stack many piezos, each at different frequency, and connect them together. To communicate at 20 kHz, we can use the piezo at 20 kHz. Now, if we want to communicate also at 21 kHz, we can attach another piezo with the resonance at 21 kHz, and so on and so forth. The problem is, with this solution, we will get a very costly and bulky structure. And because of the area of the, these piezos, we will get unwanted directionality. And overall, this solution defeats the purpose of low-cost and scalable ocean IoT. So we start asking ourselves on how we can overcome the resonance problem while maintaining low cost and low power of underwater wax casting. The solution that we had for this was by introducing a novel metamaterial design that enables ultra wideband wax casting. Metamaterials are man made structure that can give us the properties that are not found in nature material. Now, instead of limiting myself to the string of guitar or a simple piezo, I can go ahead and design new material that can give me a wide resonance. The key idea that we had was to create coupling between only two piezos, and with this coupling, we were able to synthesize many more resonances. Let me explain to you what this means. We took one piezo with resonance frequency at 20 kHz, which is shown in yellow, and we took another piezo with a different dimension with the resonance at 40 kHz, which is shown in blue, and we placed a smaller piezo inside the larger one. And what we did next, we filled the spacing between these two piezos using a polymer, which is a soft material. Now, if you take a look at the vibration of this entire structure, because the polymer is a very soft compared to the piezo, the resonance of each of those piezo will be preserved in the entire structure. So the vibration will have one resonance corresponding to the resonance of the larger piezo, and another mode of resonance corresponding to the resonance of the inner piece. But furthermore, because of the polymer and the constraint that we have defined for the vibration of these two piezo, we will get a lot of many modes and many different forms of resonances that is resulted as the interaction of between the, these moving piezos that will fill the gap between these two main resonances. And what we will get is, is the structure with the wide band resonance. With the u square b metamaterial design, we were able to overcome the resonance bottleneck and we were able to achieve ultra-wideband operations. So far, I have told you about uh, our technology on ultra-wideband underwater backscattering. And it's straightforward to see how we can go from wideband behavior to achieve higher throughput, which is just simply by backscattering at a higher rate. In our paper, we also demonstrate how we can extend the communication range of backscatter, which is done using out-of-band backscatter. And furthermore, we demonstrated how we can scale it to more nodes using FDMA-based approach. Now, let me briefly tell you about our fabrication and our result. Here, to the left, you see our fabricated transducer, and to the right, an exploded view. At the heart of our sensor is a multi-layer piezo that I told you about. We also 3D printed base and cap, added washers, and screw it together to encapsulate it for water insulation. As far as our result, we performed our experiment in Boston Charles River, and we ran more than 400 experimental trials at different range throughput and number of tenants. We showed that we can communicate with a throughput of about 20 kilobits per second, and we were able to extend the communication range to 62 meters, and we showed that we can get 10 concurrent transmission even before spatial reuse. This shows that we can improve our state of art by about five to six times along this axis. To conclude this talk, I've told you about our work on Ocean IoT. We have open sourced our code, schematics, and tutorials, and we would like to invite you to join us on this very exciting journey.
Thank you so much for watching this presentation. Thanks, thanks a lot, Reza. It was a great talk. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to it. Uh, and Thank thanks you. also for uh, answering like about 10 questions on Slack before even before your presentation started. Uh, so there's more questions coming in, uh, but I'm just going to uh, like start the ball rolling with a few questions of my own. Uh, so, so one thing that I wanted to get a little bit more insight on is, is, is what's the cost of manufacture of these metamaterials? Like, are they uh, like, like on, on what scale uh, do they exist? Yes, uh, so the, the cost of actually this, uh, the, the node that we have designed is actually pretty cheap. And that's one of the advantage that we can uh, easily scale to this system to many nodes. The cost uh, for us is around uh, $150, uh, $150 uh, for each node. Uh, but I guess it can be, it can be lower. Yeah. Makes sense. And what about the energy consumption? That how much energy does one sensor, uh, let's say, transmitting temperature data once per minute would cost? Right. So this is actually an ongoing project with a, with a, with the data that we are showing here. The, our our uh, power consumption is in the order of uh, hundreds of uh, microwatts. Uh, but uh, we have been able to uh, reduce it to uh, much lower values, but uh, for our current system, it's uh, in the order of uh, 300 microwatts. Cool, makes sense. Uh, and, and another question, uh, this is from Slack by Weishun. Uh, is, uh, since, the, uh, since the sensor is going to be in the ocean, uh, the water may erode the tag and the resonance frequency of tag uh, might also change because the tag material uh, erodes. So, uh, what like do you have comments on the longevity of the system when it operates in water for longer time? Yeah, that that was actually a great question. Uh, so, uh, there, there are a, uh, a large body of research uh, on how we can design a transducer that can last for decades on underwater, uh, and that has been done using design of the several uh, different packaging, and. The system or U square B can uh, adopt those state of art uh, packaging design. And in terms of the frequency shift, uh, that, that will happen um, as a result of the water or the hydrostatic pressure, the resonance will slightly shift. Uh, but that's not the issue for U square B because U square B is a wide band and even with slight shift in the resonance, it remains uh, fully functional. Makes sense. Uh, and and uh, I think maybe one last question from you. Uh, is there work in the community on, on biodegradability of these sensors? Because I'm imagining that uh, once you make them completely battery free, you just throw them around and let them be. But, but over time, like on the one hand, you want them to last a little bit long, but on the other hand, you want them to like naturally blend into the environment and not create like plastic waste and issues, other issues. So yeah, so your comments on that? Well, well, I guess there would be. So currently the system is that they deployed this sensor and uh, they, they use a, a underwater drone to basically pick up uh, this, uh, this transducer from underwater and same thing can be applied here. But that's actually a great, a great question to think about. There are lots of questions on the Slack. Uh, um, one of the questions is about uh, the cost of the metal material. How did you manufacture it? Uh, what's the design process? Uh, would you like to share? Right. Um, yes, so that's actually a great question. Uh, so we fabricate uh, everything in our lab. Uh, uh, so we bought a couple of elements, like a piezo. Those are, those are off-the-shelf piezos. Uh, but the rest of the fabrication, including potting, uh, everything um, polymer curing had been done in our lab and the total cost for each node which is actually one of the advantage of our work is uh, they are very cheap and they are around 100 to 150 dollar per each node and can be further uh, we can further lower it, it down great and another question is uh, did you encounter any non-linearity in acoustic signals uh, and how did you address that uh, Right, uh, so that's, a, that's actually a common issue for when you are working in acoustic element for communication because you need a high power. Uh, but that's uh, di directly proportional to the, to the piezo element that you are using. And in our case, we are using piezo ceramic, which usually they have the very high capacity to withstand the, the high voltage before getting into the nonlinear region. And it's also proportional to the dimension. So for the, uh, for the piezo that we were using, uh, we were still in the linear region, so we had the clear sign out of the out of the piezo. Okay. Great. And uh, another question is, uh, what's the durability of the tag under the water? How? Uh, what's the impact? Right. Uh, that's actually a very uh, good question. 
so there are, there are a large body of research on uh, designing a packaging for underwater transducer to help the transducer remain functional uh, for decades in the water. And our design can also directly adopt those uh, state of art design for in, in case of durability. But there's also another uh, concern, which is because of the large uh, and uh, very high hydrostatic pressure in a deep ocean, uh, we might have a little bit shift in the resonance, uh, but that's fine for our design because we have ultra wide band behavior and even with slight shift in resonance, we will have our nodes still functional. That's great. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk.